so I'm gonna talk about a paper that I think found out about a month ago so a little bit less I mean I, I knew about it uh, from conversations about the research that was done behind this uh, but I first sort of looked at the paper about a month ago and it's in the world of communications so I'll, I'll give a bit, bit of background as we go along to explain where it comes from and why what it's doing and what it's talking about uh, because the setup is actually quite critical in understanding the the cool things that they actually figured out in this paper so uh, general scheme of what how it'll go go around with things so the background uh, a little bit of introduction an intuitive understanding of what the paper is trying to talk about a uh, little bit of formalizations uh, a little bit of generalization to figure out sort of how if we can do this in uh, small cases how can we generalize to large cases uh, looking at different geometries and then a conclusion I know a lot of this stuff doesn't make sense now but we'll come to that um, as we go along a little bit background, this is a research lab at NUS. It's called the Acoustic Research Lab. Uh, it's up in the hills of NUS. If you've ever gotten lost in NUS, you probably came across some good things like this. Um, these guys do uh, work with underwater acoustics and underwater communication. Uh, so this paper is about underwater acoustics, so using acoustics to communicate underwater. Um, so ignore the use of word subnarrow here uh, I've reused this picture from somewhere else but the basic idea of underwater communication is you can have ships submarines divers and little um, notes that have sensors on them that are sensing whatever you want and communicate with each other wirelessly kind of like what we have with uh, our cell networks uh, but underwater so cell networks or any kind of RF based um, Networks do not work well underwater, mainly because RF signal uh, gets uh, decimated, or uh, the, the, it reduces power very, very quickly as it propagates through water. Compared to that, acoustic signals can go for miles or kilometers underwater without much propagation losses. Or they do have propagation losses, but they're not as significant as for RF signals. So that is one of the main ways of communicating or, or sending any kind of information underwater. The other thing that this paper talks a lot about is TDMA, uh, which is Time Division Multiple Axis. Uh, and I'll try to explain to you quickly here what TDMA does. And as we go along with the paper, we'll sort of come back to what TDMA is. Uh, and maybe we'll get a better understanding then. But I'll try it now. So the basic idea is you have two people, uh, one, uh, you know, user one and user two, who want to communicate over the same channel, over the same frequency range. Right, so this is the frequency that you're talking over. And you, you have to share the channel. You have to share that frequency that you're communicating, communicating over. Uh, and there are multiple ways of sort of dicing this, this space up into ways you can communicate. And time, time division multiple access is the simplest and the most intuitive. And it basically says the first, you know, this is the time access to so the first whatever, and 10 milliseconds, you get to talk. In the second 10 milliseconds, I get to talk. And the next 10 milliseconds, you get to talk. Next in the seconds, I get to talk. So this, this is a very simple scheme. So this is called a, a frame, which is when everybody gets to do do it once, and then you sort of keep repeating that. So that's so. This is a very very simple and, and extremely basic scheme. You can get much more complex schemes where people can uh, say that hey, I want to talk, and then people, you know you get uh, uh, request to send, clear to send. You get much more complex schemes, but. The basic idea is you're dividing in time instead of dividing in frequency, which is the other type, FDMA, frequency division, where you say that I speak at you know 10 kilohertz, you speak at you know 50 kilohertz. So we definitely have different channels that way. So there are multiple ways of doing this, and but TDMA is something that we'll look at a lot in this paper. Um, so one of the interesting, so this whole paper talks a lot about something called propagation delay, which I think needs to be defined. So propagation delay is the amount of time it takes for a communication signal to travel from the source to the destination over a given transmission medium. So the interesting thing here is the fact that it's heavily dependent on transmission medium. Uh, and that's because we always assume for communication, because that's what we do all the time, that the signals are either electrical you know, voltages in a wire or electromagnetic you know, signals over air. And both of these, uh, in both of these mediums, um, signals travel pretty fast. Um, you're talking close to light speeds. Uh, but in other mediums, uh, where, you know, for, for the kind of distances we're looking at, 
the speed is much much lower propagation delay becomes something that's super important and super interesting to, to have to work with so I'll give you um, some numbers uh, speed of radio waves in air is whatever that number is basically ver very very close to light speed um, speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second which is fast but not pretty fast speed of sound in wave uh, speed of sound waves in water is five times that about 1500 meters per second depends on salinity of water and a bunch of other things but still much 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 slower than this so that means that if you have two things in water and they are communicating with each other with an acoustic signal which travels at this if they're two kilometers apart it's gonna take 1.3 seconds for something that you emit from here to reach there and 1.3 seconds for something that you, you emit from there to reach back so imagine if you have something like a TCP where you're sending something and you're waiting for an ACK that ACK is gonna take 2.6 seconds so you're gonna have a lot of weird um, problems because of this at different layers of your network stack so you're talking about TCP protocols you're gonna have to deal with much longer delays much longer timeouts you're talking about medium access control everybody needs to take ownership of the medium for a much longer time so all the stuff that we have developed in your in a normal sort of TCP IP stacks uh, at, in, either in sort of wired or wireless networks needs to change because all the schemes that we came up were assuming you are almost zero signal transmission time or propagation delay. But that's not the case anymore. So here's an interesting issue what happens. So a sender is trying to send a packet, uh, which is taking some time, goes over, and then wait for the, the receiver to send an act back and go on. And, and you see like all this time is completely wasted. You're just waiting for, for things to happen and nothing's actually going on. And this is very, very um, inefficient. So the paper comes up with a very interesting observation that um, using very, u very, very specially crafted ways and mechanisms on schedules of sending packets, you can actually get better throughput in uh, 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 in an underwater acoustic scenario that they, they came up with here uh, in, a, in a network that has long propagation delays in comparison to a network that has negligible propagation delays. Now, it seems very preposterous that you can get better throughput and I think that's mainly because of the definition of throughput because the definition of throughput here is uh, normalized to link rate. So, you cannot go around the fact that the physical number, you know, the, like the, the speed of sound in water is always going to be whatever, a hundred times or a thousand times slower than the speed of you know, RF in air. But if you normalize on that, you can actually get more data through uh, by using these interesting schemes of, of sending data, um, uh, which is what they call super TDMA, uh, than if you can get by sending stuff to air. So I think. As we go through it, we'll see a lot more of the the, the explanation of how they calculate throughput. But, but <coughs> isn't there a strategy stealing argument to be made here that on a low latency network you can always just pretend that you haven't received whatever package? Like if you just put a, a so few. Sure, yeah, I think all of that stuff is being looked at at a higher level, but what they figure out here is you can use um, some of the characteristics of the medium itself to be able to push more packets into the water, so to say, um, before w w uh, at, a, at, at a much lower level. So all your queuing and the way you deal with that at a higher level, in your higher level networks, definitely you can use some of those uh, things as well, but this is more at a physical layer kind of a... Uh, implementation. So uh, the first part of the paper looks at an intuitive understanding of um, try to get an intuitive understanding of what this hack is to allow you to do more. Um, so there's a couple of assumptions that we need to uh, agree with. One is that all the all the transducers are half duplex, and that's just the physics of how the the kind of um, electronics and the the, the, the transducers or or the 
antennas basically. Oh, they're called hydrophones in water. Uh, the kind of hydrophones uh, that, that are there uh, allow you, uh, can either transmit or receive at a given point of time. They can't do both. Uh, that's just how it is right now. Uh, hopefully in some time in the future we might be able to go around that with some new materials and so on and so forth. But currently most of the ones you get can either transmit or receive. So that kind of... Uh, is, is it because of the medium or because of the, the instruments? It's because of the physics. It's, it's just the physics of the, the vibrations and the way they make the... the it's mostly piezoelectric uh, based uh, elements that when you uh, put some current across them they emit sound. Uh, and it's just the way they work. You, if you, if you, you basically there's way too much noise when you're trying to receive while you're sending. It's all mostly self noise. So you just although there are two, they, they affect each oh other. Oh yeah, they will affect each other like nobody's business. So you can't sort you of hear have yourself. You basically hear yourself so much that you can't hear anything above uh, what else, you, it's what somebody else is speaking. Especially also because the difference in the signal of what you hear and what you send out is massive. So you just overwhelm uh, by what you're sending. Uh, and also, you're, you want to try to achieve fair schedules, so you, want, you don't want to have a, a scheme where uh, in your TDMA, just this guy, one gets to send all the time, and then two doesn't get to send ever. So that's not, that's not fair. And, and we want to try to come up with fair schedules as much as possible, but uh, sometimes uh, we might not be able to do it, so we can do that. Um, so the, the, the sort of the, the typical way of looking at throughput or how you calculate scheduling for for you know a simple two node network is you know at some time t1 node 1 sends a packet to node 2 and it takes some time delta t to arrive and at some time t2 node 2 sends a packet to node 1 and that takes uh, you know delta t time to arrive and delta t is depending on the distance is distance divided by whatever the velocity of the of the medium is so that's in air, it's going to be some ridiculously small number, and in water, it's going to be you know two thirds of a second. Uh, so that's one packet per delta t seconds. That's the approximate throughput, if you can think about it, of the of the of the medium. Right? Because you're just you're sending one packet. It takes every packet takes one delta t seconds to to reach the other side. Uh, so the scheme they come up with is: what if both of them can transmit at the same time? Uh, and if you think about it, this guy transmits, it takes delta t seconds to reach here. And this guy transmits and it takes delta t, t seconds to reach here. Um, because the time taken to actually transmit um, is actually, if, if, or rather, if you can make it such that the time taken to transmit is equal to the time taken to reach the other side, then you can basically transmit two packets within the same delta t seconds. So in one time slot, you basically have the, 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 the two nodes transmitting packets in the other way, and by the time they're done transmitting, they're ready to receive the one that the other guy sent, because the time it took for the packet to go through the water was exactly the time it took for this guy to emit the packet. So in a, in a very, very simplistic intuitive mechanism, you can basically double the throughput. So in, in this, using this schedule, if you can continuously uh, keep uh, sending and receiving packets, and, and you basically have double the throughput. Yeah. But if, if, okay, so I, I can see how this would work if really you just want to ping pong, but if you mostly want to send something, mm -hmm. then... That's why the assumption of fair schedules is important. <laughs> so it, it, does, uh, it does make better sense for, uh, in an in a assumption that we want to have as much Fair, like everybody wants to communicate with everybody else, mm -hmm. but if you have links that are that want to need to communicate more than other links or in more one direction than the other, uh, then some of the stuff or some of the optimizations that end up at the end of this paper might not hold up. I think. But I think that's a good point. Um, yeah. So again, um, sort of a, another way to put out, put it, put this out as the paper says is the notes to transmit uh, notes transmit simultaneously, and letting their packets cross in flight, which is something that's kind of hard to bend your mind around. That you have these signals that are overlapping in the water, and and it's fine, and it, they end up on their the respective ends without having any kind of interference or any problems. Uh, and the other thing is that the packet duration has to equal the propagation delay to to ensure that you have a fair and optimal schedule. So 
uh, if you if your packet duration, uh, as in like the, the actual packet length, uh, is much is different than the, the, the delay between two nodes, then uh, you will have uh, different. You, you you might not get the optimal schedule. But then they actually go on to say, if that's the case, how can you rework the math to de redefine the packet length? So you basically get a LCM of all the delays there are in the node, and then that's your packet. So you just make bigger and bigger packets, and that's in, that ensures that um, uh, you basically can can still get a fair schedule and optimal schedule for any kind of a given network. But we'll we'll get to the generalization in a, in a second. So yeah, that's the that's the question. Um, the sort of after, after the first intuitive understanding of what could be done, uh, the paper goes on to ask, can we generalize this? Right? We, we we see this working with two nodes. We see that we can get double the input, uh, double the output uh, for two nodes. Can we generalize this to n nodes? Uh, can we? What kind of geometries and schedules can we come up with? Or rather, given a geometry, can you come up with a schedule? Given a schedule, can you come up with the geometry? Uh, and are these optimal? Can they be near optimal? What are the some of the physical issues that we have to deal with at that? Take a quarter. <clears throat> so to define that, um, define a system to be able to solve for the generalization questions. Uh, they define a bunch of assumptions and a bunch of terms and definitions. Uh, so, as we talked about before, all the nodes are half duplex. Uh, the network only carry unicast messages, so there's no concept of a broadcast. So, every node is talking to another node and not one node talking to 25 at one time. Uh, the messages transmitted by a node reaches every other node. So, that's an assumption that as long as you are in a single network, and that's how they define the network, everybody can hear you. Uh, so that, that just makes it simpler, uh, as well as actually in certain cases slightly harder, but some of the math gets simple because of this. Because in some previous research, what they, what they figured out that if you're far enough away that by the time the signal from this node reaches that, that node, um, it's way too soft, then you can ignore that node. You can, you can, you, you, you can just say that that node didn't get anything. Uh, and that way you can sort of hack around some schedules. But they didn't want to use that, uh, so that that was something that they sort of said. Okay, no, we don't have to. We don't want to think about that. That doesn't mean it's, it's similar to broadcasting, no? If everybody hears everything. Yeah, but but it might not be meant for you. So, no. for example, if I if I want to talk to him, if I if I emit, you will hear it too. But it's not meant for you. But the point is, if if you might not hear it because you're too far, I might be able to do more optimizations, because then I can transmit something to you. Well, you are receiving something from him, but you won't hear from me, but you might hear from him because it's nearer. So the channel is free for us. So, but that then what they define is that's a two, two sort of different networks that are connected to each other. So it's a different so problem to solve. So they don't want to solve that problem here. And the last one is very important. If, if both of us talk to you at the same time, you won't hear either. So that's a very that's actually where a lot of the challenges for the optimization problem that they set up come from, is how do you ensure that this is what they call interference doesn't happen at a receiving node. So the receiving node should not or should have as little interference as possible, and 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 that will ensure that you have the most optimum schedule. Uh, so they have a bunch of terms that are defined. So there's a collision is exactly what I was talking about. If two signals come at the receiver and at the same time, then it's a collision. Uh, interference is, if I'm talking to him, for everybody else, that message is interference because you don't want to be receiving that, if possible. But they come up with schemes to ensure that even if I'm talking to him, if, if you receive it, how can you optimize yourself so that you do something while you're receiving to be able to, to fit as much data into the schedule as you can. Uh, and throughput, again, which is the interesting term, is the total number of bits successfully transmitted by all nodes per unit time, normalized by the ring link rate. So <coughs> while you're talking to him, yeah. I, am I free to talk? Yes. Because, you know, we'll, yes. But doesn't that kind of, like, okay, the half duplex assumption yes. is for, it's, it's I per, 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 per modem. Yeah. yeah, but that means I will not know 
Yeah. That and, you're not talking to me, but him. Yeah, but unless uh, we know uh, uh, beforehand when who gets to talk. Right? And also to whom? Yes. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. See, okay. yes. So if that schedule of saying that at the first time slot I get to talk to you, mm -hmm. at the second time slot you get no, at, at the first time slot while I'm talking to you, uh, it, it takes one time slot for me to reach both of you, and when you're when he's receiving, you can then transmit at the same time. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, We'll get to that. There's a nice diagram that can do much better job than me at, at that. But yes, that's the thing. It's it's half duplex means I can uh, talk, uh, but uh, at one time, but I can't receive at the same time. That's the only thing. Or rather, if I receive something when I talk, I won't be able to de decode that. So that will just be ignored. Uh, some mathematical stuff because it goes into pretty heavy math. So uh, DIJ is the propagation delay between every pair of nodes. Uh, we are looking at a generic N node network. Uh, beta is the number of bits per second, which is the constant link rate. So that's assumed to be what, depending on whatever uh, scheme you're using for your uh, keying, it's the constant link rate of a network. Uh, so the information carried by the link, by a link in in mu seconds, is is beta u. So that's just some math that starts getting into a, a little bit more interesting as we go along. So. And you don't make so you don't make any assumptions about D, so it's, it doesn't have to be like metric space. At yeah, least. we're getting there. That's why it's IJ. So we're getting into a, 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 a delay matrix. Okay. Uh, you're talking about like matrices, right? Or no, I mean, the, does it need? Okay, do you use the fact that like if it's really in the ocean, right? right? It's it's a metric space. It's a normal space, right? It's not just any matrix. Uh, Yes, 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 yes. So that's used, but I don't. Like you have the triangle inequality. You have yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they they do talk about that, although I didn't take most most of that in my slides because the paper is quite big. It's about fourteen pages. So if you want to look at that, there they, they do treat that and use some of that stuff. But I didn't pick it up for the slides because I didn't want. It was I was trying to figure out what I can talk about within this time and some of the stuff that I can. Ignore and or, or leave it to homework. Uh, so the next part is trying to go from a two-node network to a three, and see what we can do with the three-node network. Uh, so simple again, uh, just an equilateral triangle again. For making it easy for intuitive understanding, you are just ensuring it's equilateral. So the time delay for each of the three between each of the three networks is exactly the same. Uh, and of course, because of the thing we were using. We also assume that A is the time taken for the packet, so it's the length of the packet as well. Is the playtime uh, stable? Is it always the same? Uh, it is not completely stable, but it is pseudo stable. So you can you can run some adapt adaptive control algorithms to guess it and track it over time. So it's uh, stable enough to be able to. Um, to be able to assume for you know mathematical purposes that it's stable. Uh, also, the other treatment that they do talk about in the paper, which I kind of ignored because it was just getting too long again, was um, by having some extra guard periods at the end to just in case that uh, it's more of like, what if the modem physically moves because of a current in water? You know, you've deployed it at some point and you know, like unlike our Wi-Fi hotspots, that that thing's probably not going to move more than a few millimeters, but you know, in, in, in the ocean, stuff can move all the time. So to deal with that, they use um, uh, this extra small durations at the end of each, uh, each each period, just so that stuff, if it's varying a bit, it's, it still can hit within the time period. Uh, the math of that gets a bit more hairy because you have to, to, get, to, have to care for this, this guard period every time. But the general theorems still fall down and the, op and the, the, the upper bound theorem still ends up being uh, very, very close to the upper bound that they talk about. So it's not that far off for the sort of physical manifestations of uh, some of these theories. Um, so they, 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 they come up with a schedule um, that explains how we can do something similar in, in a three node network. So node one, let, let's ignore this, let's start from here. Uh, node one at time zero transmits to node two. So node one transmits to node two. Uh, while at the same time, node 2 is trying to receive from node 3 and node 3 is receiving from node 2. But this is from the previous one. We'll, we'll get, so you can ignore these for now. 
right? So the first, the first time slot, node one transmits to node two, right? The next time slot, of course, node two has to receive from node one, right? Because you just transmitted, takes one time slot to, to actually propagate over. So the next time slot, node two has to receive from node one. So remember, the main thing is that transmission and re reception take time. Uh, and, and like you need to wait for an entire time slot to actually receive the, the packet because the packet is long and it takes time to propagate through. Um, and then in the second time slot, node one tries to trans uh, transmit to, uh, to three, node three transmits to one, and of course this means that this receives the, in the next time slot, this receives the next time slot, and so on and so forth. And if you realize that after this, the schedule can repeat. So you can keep doing this forever and you basically get to transmit one, two, three, four, five, six um, packets every frame. Uh, so, but, uh, isn't there interfer interference? interference? So, so the interesting thing is, so when this guy is transmitting, this guy is receiving, this guy gets interference, but it doesn't care because it transmits at the same time. Right? It's, it's, so at, at this point, Node ah, 3 okay. does receive from node 1, but instead of bothering to just receive, it just says, screw this shit, I'm just going to transmit. Okay, no, the, but, uh, but the other one, 1 and 3, is, is hearing the same thing, right? Yeah, so, so when, 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 node, when node 1 transmits here, 2 and 3 receive the same at the same time. So both of them get the signal, this guy actually receives, this guy ignores and transmits. Okay. So that's a very... Uh, but, but, but yeah, 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 the next one. This one? Two, yeah. So one and three are... So th 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 this is transmitting, so this receives. Yes. Also the three... Uh, the and then this is transmitting, so this receives. Yes. Yeah, so that's what... Uh, so it's crossing. Okay. Okay. This is the crossing. Same as the first uh, so you, 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 won't, you won't hear yourself. You won't hear yourself, though. Okay. Because it's already gone out, right? It's projecting outwards. Ah, okay. That's nice. Um, but so the basic... If you think about it, the basic idea is when you are hitting interference, just transmit. Right? <laughs> that's, that's the very, very yeah, simple thing. The yeah. second you think that you know that according to the schedule you're going to get interference, just transmit. And that's a very interesting uh, heuristic that we will see come back later again uh, when you try to solve the optimization problem and they realize that it's too, com too complex, so let's try to reduce the optimization problem. And this is one of the uh, heuristics they use to reduce the complexity of the problem. So that's the very simple thing. If you have, two, if you have interference, just transmit. To ignore and just transmit. You can also see here that it's two times m minus one is going to be a upper bound. I yes. mean, a lower bound than the frame size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll come to that. Um, so analysis: um, the schedule ensures that interference from other nodes only arrives when the node is transmitting. Right. So this is the this is the the main magical secret in this entire paper. Um, of course, you ensure that the the transmit message duration is the same as the, uh, the packet length um, and the nodes can su successfully transmit six messages with uh, beta u bits e every t seconds so the, the way they calculate the throughput which is the number of bits um, normalized <laughs> to the link rate is 1.5 so that's their definition of, of, of throughput um, and it's 50% higher than the maximum throughput of a three node network without propagation delay so if you if you calculate Again, throughput normalized to link rate in a normal network where you're just transmitting on the three-node network. The maximum theoretical throughput you would ever get is is one. Uh, that's basically everybody transmitting at the same time. But because of this ability to trans transmit while still something else is in water, you can get a little bit more. Yeah, using water as the buffer. <laughs> basically, that's 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 what the paper talks about. You're using the water as a buffer. To, to sort of hold stuff for you while you are still doing something else. Uh, so the question is, how much can you, how much, how much crazier can you go, right? So initially, like if you if you look at um, TDMA, like uh, Wi-Fi wi TDMA papers, uh, reaching one throughput of normalized throughput of one is like the, the holy grail. Yes. Like if you can reach anywhere close to one, you are like it's awesome. But now we beat one. So 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 when they first figured out. Uh, that they could go over one. I was like, okay, wait a second. How how much more can you go? Right. The more nodes you have, the higher the number. Yep. Exactly. That's that's the final theory. Uh, theory. But so then the, the 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 rest of the paper basically goes into the mathematical analysis of, firstly, what is the theoretical 
max on you can go and is there a relationship with the number of nodes like you said and then the, the more interesting question which is given a, 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 a geometry can you come up with a schedule which is optimal which hits this thing I mean th this is just one schedule you can come up with all sorts of schedules which will go everywhere from no packets being ever transmitted because everything is interfered all the time to you know 1.5 uh, throughput of 1.5 so figuring out a schedule on a g for a given geometry is something that that's interesting and the mathematical proof for that is what the paper talks about so it's all about schedules it's all about how do you schedule how different when and when who talks to who when so um, this is a very simple way for a four node network to come up with a schedule so let's say this node is trying to talk to this node and because of the way the delays work there is interference here and here so so basically these two are equally distance away from this this is about half the distance away so node two is half the distance away this is this, this distance is two this distance is sorry one two and two Right. So this guy transmits, this guy receives, but this, these two get interference. So the way the so, so this is the kind of geometry. Where they so, yeah, so this is not this is not a triangle line. geometry, but this is this could be a more complex geometry where one is nearer and two are a little bit further away. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry, this the I couldn't find a better uh, explanation of how to fill up the schedule, and the only one I found was a much more complex geometry. So. I forgot to put the the definition of the delay matrix for this. Uh, this is very obvious because we have one transmit, one receive. The rest of the the rest of the other nodes are all in interference mode. That's that's your yeah, yeah yeah yeah. But it's just that it's just that this bit uh, the the distance between this node and this node is mm. two, and this node and this one is one, and this node and this node is two as well. Mm. Right. So the distance is not the but, same. But the distance is not. A parameter in this diagram. So <laughs> no, it is. It, it kind of is because this guy transmits here. Yeah. This guy gets interference immediately, but this guy only receives the next slot, right? Mm. So this is t t zero t l uh, t a. Sorry, t this is uh, t zero t one. This is t two, right? So it's like. Suppose that you have the okay, so, so number line, then you, you if if. If the I one you, that transmits is on one, then both zero and two. So, so the near, the nearer you are, the less propagation delay you should experience. Yes, yeah. correct, yeah. correct, correct. So, so this is nearer. This is definitely this, nearer. This is nearer. Then and the these two are, are uh, equal distance away. Two, two, two periods twice. away. Yes, two periods away. Correct. Two, two slots away. Yeah. In in fact, if if you want, I can try to pull up the. Do you think it will help if, if I pull up the the, the continue the, first the delay matrix for this? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, the, the more interesting thing here is. The, the intuitive way you can fill up a schedule or make a schedule based on this scheme is every time it's trying to, it's going to have an interference, just transmit. <laughs> so because of this transmission, now I can fill up the rest of the stuff, right? So you know that this guy is going to be received here. Uh, sorry, it's going to be received here and this guy is going to be received here, I guess. Yeah, and then they're going to have interference everywhere else. So if you keep doing this, and in this scenario, they were lucky, yeah, I guess it's a very... Um, specific example they showed to, to figure out how the, the schedule can be filled up. You can get a nicely full schedule where, again, same thing, wherever there were uh, interference boxes, they just overrode them with TX, and then the whole thing sort of nicely adds up. Uh, I, I don't think this was a this was a lucky thing. This was, uh, from my understanding, no, my, my understanding, this was a solution that they searched using the, 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 the technique that they described in the rest of the paper, but it just made this diagram to explain the fact that how you can fill up a schedule and how why it's all about schedules. So, I don't want you to like spoil the result, but sure. did they get lucky in the sense that if if they had a different geometry, different uh, metric, uh, then it would no. have worked? Or? Well, okay. yeah. Uh, yes and um, no, mostly no. Uh, it's just it's 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 solvable for all geometries. That's the interesting solution there. Um, so generalization, let's get to that. Um, so you can come up with a delay matrix for every geometry. So the idea is, uh, of course, self delay is zero and you ignore that. So uh, this is the delay from node one to node one, node one to node two, <laughs> node two to node one, and node one, node two to node two. So self delay is zero, all other delays are whatever the delay is. Uh, in this case, it's normalized, so it's just one. Uh, so, uh, of course, in a in a in a triangle, same thing. Oh, I think this is the one. 
or no, this is not the one. Um, sorry. So, so they define a schedule matrix, which is basically defining uh, how you can uh, you, you can describe a schedule in a matrix. So the idea is if node one is supposed to transmit to node two, it's written as two. If node two is supposed to receive from node three at the, in this time slot, then it's minus three. Uh, and if it's node, node 3 is supposed to receive from node 2, it's minus 2. So it's just a nomenclature, it's just a pattern they use to de describe so that they can use this for the math. So if it's greater than 0, j transmits to i. If it's less than 0, j trans it re receives from i. And if it's 0, it does nothing. So the basic idea is try to ha not have any zeros in your schedule matrix. So that's, that's when you get optimum schedule, right? So simple. Um, so, uh, the schedule repeats with the period, so uh, of, of some value t, so basically every, every time you add t to, the period, to, the, to any value, it should go back and loop around and get the same value. Uh, that also means, there's also another interesting uh, property that you can use, which is if j is supposed to receive from i at t, then, then uh, t is supposed to, trans uh, sorry, then uh, i is supposed to transmit to j at the previous, that many previous uh, 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 free, um, slots, right? So if you look at it here, if this guy is supposed to transmit to this guy here, then this guy is supposed to receive to this guy from here. So these two are sort of related to each other. And if, if I tell you one, you should be able to guess the other. So that's, that's something that's sort of binding the matrix. And, and it's some stuff that they can use for some of the math for later. Um, and the fact that the schedule has equal number of transmit and receive. If you don't have that, then that's kind of a crappy schedule. <laughs> so if, if you want a good schedule, it, it basically has, or any, any schedule where stuff is not lost, you transmit and you're just ignoring it, then it should have equal number of transmits and receives. Um, and then define this weird function called one, uh, one i, which is uh, zero if it's false and one if it's true. So if the math gets confusing, just uh, this is what most of the time confused me. Um, so the throughput of a schedule is the sum of how many non-zero, sorry, half of the total number of non-zero, so or the, the total number of positive or the total number of negative uh, terms in a schedule. So if you have, you know, six uh, positive terms, then that six transmits. That means it's uh, the, the, the 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 throughput is six. Oh, sorry, six divided by the time period, sorry, number of slots. Um, so, the, there's math, and I'm not going to cover the math because it's a bunch of math. So, if you're interested in it, go into the math and look into it. So the first theorem is kind of what you're looking at. Was there's an up, upper bound for the schedule uh, for the schedule throughput, which is half of the total number of nodes, which is what you were talking about. So, the more number of nodes you have, the more throughput you get, and it's always going to be bounded by uh, half of the total number of nodes. So, if you have a three-node network, the maximum you can ever get in the perfect geometry, in a perfect schedule, if you find optimal sch schedule, is 1.5, which is what we saw. Um, for basically, and then depending on the schedule, if you don't have an optimal schedule, it will be less than half. So. Sorry, uh, I didn't catch the first part. All the period must be of a constant, is it? Or you can have period? So what they do is they, they, uh, they, do, they basically figure out how you can have um, you can yeah basically you can do a LCM of all the periods and then get a, a, a packet length which is much bigger so that everything is integer multiple of each other. So they basically make a make a massive packet so that it's always an integer multiple of each other. Not massive packets, massive, massive frame. Massive frame, sorry. Yeah. Um, so we talked about earlier, uh, perfect schedules are when there's no zero entries. Uh, and a perfect schedule will achieve the n by 2 upper bound. So this is just simple math. Um, so they also talk about in some cases, there are the in, uh, perfect schedules cannot exist. Uh, and that's ma mainly if you have uh, odd number of nodes with, odd number of, uh, with an odd period. So if you have odd number of nodes, your period needs to be of even number of packets. Uh, yeah. So otherwise, they, they don't exist. Again, bunch of math, um, but you can you can look into it. And then you kind of came to that, which was that uh, n times c minus one divided by two t, which is the uh, no 
No, that's the next theorem. We will come to the one that you came up with earlier, uh, which is the, the frame length. Um, and the corollary to two is that for a network with odd number of nodes, a periodic schedule, and odd number of period t, the upper bound is nt minus one divided by two t. So you can look into the math, but it gets a bit hairy. Uh, and yeah, the fair schedules, if, if for n uh, node network, a periodic per link fair schedule can only exist for a period t equals 2k n minus one. So it's always going to be k, k is a a any positive integer. So basically, uh, uh, but the main, main thing to think about this is they, they define this as a per link fair schedule. Uh, so it's not a per node fair schedule. So per link fair is between two links, whereas per node share is for per, per node, everybody should be able to uh, send and receive equally to everybody else. So a per node share uh, fair schedule will be able to uh, talk to every, every other person fairly, whereas a per link fair schedule means every link is, 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 has equal amount of uh, traffic on it. So slightly different. This is the one thing that I had to reread the paper a couple of times to, to figure out uh, what they were trying to do because I misinterpreted these two terms. If you're reading it, just keep an eye on the per link fairness and per node fairness. Very common. Yeah, I can imagine it's a very common problem for noobs in in this comps field. Um, and perfect halos do not exist for um, linear no uh, geometries. Uh, so linear geometries have a lot of weird issues because uh, of the way the the distances add up. Basically, you you the, the first person gets something and the next person gets something. So some of the hacks that you know they did earlier with the, the scheduling won't work for a linear schedule, and there's a mathematical proof to why that won't work. Um, but having given these sort of issues where it won't work in certain geometries and certain um, uh, sort of networks, um, if you try to go try to figure out how um, it can work with other interesting geometries. So um, this is. Again, back to our, the first one that we worked with, which was simple two node network. This is the, the delay matrix. This is the schedule. Um, three node one. So this is the schedule we looked at earlier as well. Uh, so this is, I didn't find a diagram for this. It's an isosceles triangle. So the first node is, is two, uh, one uh, distance away, and the two second node is two. So it's, a, it's an isosceles triangle. So uh, it's a much bigger frame. Uh, which you talked about earlier, so you have to get a bigger frame. But it, it again, it's a it's a schedule that works out, and once again, you get uh, three over two, so one point five. So it's an optimum schedule. Equilateral. Uh, equilateral is the first one. This is what we did, okay. the, the common one. So Achilles is this. Uh, they go on to a couple more. I they they go on to a tetrahedron as one one as well by. So, so which means that this network applies to three D space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because. Yes. I was thinking, in, yes. the, in the C, uh, you can actually play yeah. around with, with Yes, three. I have a tetrahedron. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But that also kind of answers my question. So you really do use the fact that it's a geometry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that way. Okay. The like a, uh, it's not just a matrix. It's, it's a full. Yes. Yes, yes. That way. Yes, yes. And yes, you actually, interestingly enough, get a. This is a weird one. So you actually get a, a, a throughput of two. But if you notice, um, Two talks to one and one talks to two, uh, and that's it. And then three talks to four and four talks to three. So one and two don't talk to three and four, and, and, and three and four don't talk to one and two. So it's almost like you have, you're having two separate networks, but at any given point, you can swap any two. Yeah. And then you can keep going, right? Because it's, it's, it's only, it's sort of, you know. So, yeah. so but that means your, your actual frame would be double this size, right? Yeah. You can you can go double the size if you want and then get that. So, so you there's a trade-off, but but that's uh, a tetrahedron. And and again, this was the one that you that I said was because this is, this doesn't seem to be fair per node, but they define this as per link fair. Per link fair. This is still per link fair, but yes. it's not per node fair. Yes. So. The, the minus one should be one. Yeah. yeah, that's a typo. That's me. And also in the first. Um, I mean, I yeah, the this four is minus. Is, uh, huh? This is plus this is wrong. Four yeah. Four minus three and then minus four plus three. Yeah, they should be. Yeah, they should be crossed. Agreed. My fault. 
didn't didn't copy it properly. Um, so, moving on to a more so again, this was a more intuitive understanding of of how much further you can go. Let's try to go even further. So basically, they define it as an optimization problem, uh, and they call it a sequential decision problem. I'm not an expert in, or I have no idea about dynamic programming or optimization in general, but I tried to guess and understand how much as I could in this paper. Um, the, resu the resulting solution is optimal, but the co it's computationally infeasible. Um, they also propose a, a sum of some sort of heuristic improvements to the optimization problem to reduce the complex uh, complexional, computational complexity. Um, so, um, I will go through some of the formulation of the sequential decision problem and some of the interesting parts, but I won't go through some of the more hardcore math. Uh, but basically, they model the whole thing as uh, a transition. So every uh, every step, you know, when we saw those three diagrams with the three um, uh, schedules, like unfilled schedule, and you start filling up the schedule and you go along. <coughs> so each step is a is a is a is a decision that you take, uh, and that's the sequential decision. So you decide which part of the schedule to fill up. Some sometimes your hands are forced because if you put a transmission a transmission here, you know it's going to be interference here, and you know it's going to be a, a reception here. But other parts, you're open to figuring out whether you want to add a, a, a transmission here or not. And that's the basic, that's the, the thing that you actually optimize against. Uh, that, right, that, that's the thing you optimize, and you optimize it against a, a reward function, which I think they, am I define it here? No, I'll, I'll, oh yeah, they, they define it against a reward function, which is this, which is a total number of um, transmissions, basically, right? So you want to optimize to have as many transmissions as possible, um, and the throughput is always going to be the, the as t tends to infinity the one over t the the reward for that uh, the, the the summation of the, all the reward functions. Did I miss something here? Yeah. So q q t is the partial schedule at any given time t. So that's the sort of state snapshot of uh, as you're transitioning between uh, through the decision problem. Yeah. So. To actually solve it by dynamic programming, you need to define something called the value function. I did not understand a bunch of this because this this led me into Wikipedia and then I was lost uh, on, on dynamic programming. So if anybody understands dynamic programming and it's doesn't understand this... It's, it's a bit, of, bit, bit like evolution, evolutionary programming. So, so, so you, you define functions and you give it to a... Uh, framework to solve it. Uh, the interesting thing though, there... Oh yeah, so, so I tried to summarize what it does, it basically uses something called relative value iteration to iteratively estimate the value of the function v, which is the value function that's defined here. Uh, and then the resulting algorithm works in practice, it yields optimal schedules for many small networks. Unfortunately, the cardinality grows rapidly with n and g, n is the number of nodes, and g is, this, uh, uh, is the maximum distance between two nodes in the entire network, so how widely stretched your network is. Um, so uh, uh, let's say an uh, uh, equilateral triangle network is just the maximum is still uh, a, whereas if it's the same network with three nodes but in you know in a linear it's two a and that that's what they what they define this maximum distance as g. Oh. So with cardinality, so with as n and g increase, uh, you basically end up growing much much rapidly because it's a o n by n to n problem. And it's just super impossible to solve uh, <laughs> for large networks with any realistic thing. So they come up with some interesting ways to go around it. So if you know the value function, the problem simplifies to enumerating the decision space and finding the optimal decision. So rather than estimating the value function iteratively, it is possible to develop an approximate value function based on the structure of the problem. So this is where, where they actually use what we were talking about earlier, with these heuristics that hey, instead of just guessing the value function from nowhere, why don't we seed it with, data, uh, with intuition like, oh, when, when there's a when there's a interference occurring, transmit. So these kind of heuristics help to reduce some of the complexity. Uh, but it's still really complex, and then they talk about a couple more sort of improvements they use to reduce the complexity. I kind of didn't understand those. <laughs> May I have one question? Yes. This algorithm distributed, or does it assume that we have central node that knows all the distance? Yeah, that's the question I want to ask. So, 
are the nodes themselves aware of how to optimize and complete? Or no, I think this is uh, so. The assumption is that this is done completely a priori to setting up the network. So you 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 create a schedule beforehand, mm. then you give it to all nodes, and everybody knows their schedules beforehand. What if you're qualified? What if you're what? Qualified. Oh, oh, if you if you drift, they can deal with it. But if your boy decides to take a a, a cruise ship to the other end of the world, okay, that yeah. th that can't be dealt with. Yeah, because that that's like the most interesting setting. But actually, I mean, the cruise ship part. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, but even in like I, the I first, one of the first slides yeah. is showing like use cases of underwater yeah. application, and yeah. we had some. Sure. Objects there which move around yep. not yep. by accident, yep. but because that's the whole point. So, so if you know your mobility a priori, you might be able to do some complete so some optimizations. But even then, that's going to be really hard. Yeah. So there is there is so this doesn't really take into account mobile nodes yet. I think underwater networks we are still not at that point. E even though point. one of them is lost, there is no... Um, yeah, that could be one way to do it, right? You just say that, that you know, the higher layers to deal with that. This is... You're, you're trying to, you know... And then you don't even have to change the schedule. It's yeah, you just throw it here and it's yeah. yeah. Or you could do it in such so a way that you have... No, or you, you could do it in such a way that you have... Um, you know, you know, if you know your position, you can say that if I move from this locality to this locality, then I now am in, uh, uh, I'm inside another zone. So now I, I follow that zone's schedule instead of this zone yeah. schedule. So you could do that kind of thing as well. So that means the boy needs to be GPS and able. Yes. They need to know their own location. Yes, yes. Boy is easy. Think of a uh, submarine. <laughs> no, <I think laughs> no, Even more complicated because so, so they do say that if you have, if you the amount of th drift is. Um, Sort of not that high compared to distances, because distances they're talking about kilometers, two kilometers, four kilometers, five kilometers. Right. If the drift is a few meters or you know a few tens of meters, they can deal with it in the in the algorithm. They are, they are thinking calm water. I'm yeah. thinking in a storm. Sure, but how, uh, yeah, I agree. Of course, so I mean when the when the what because they are thinking of water planar uh, in, in a planar surface. Mm -hmm. but if if the water is configured sure. Sure. different sure. dynamic configuration, Absolutely. then. Your schedule may fail. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. There's it probably a joke to be made here about how you can make the algorithm more and more complex, and meanwhile the Soviets just use the bigger end. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Um, def or most probably, definitely. Um, so, yeah, so what there? There is more more things than the bigger algorithm. First, we have planar ish graph. Yes. The second to be. Possibly can pre-evaluate it yes. from GPS positions. Yes. The third thing is that hopefully it doesn't change too often or too much, so you can approximate it and then use this approximation to follow on. Yep. I'm surprised that nobody really played with it. I think they are playing with it, and and mm -hmm. and that's exactly the kind of research that this lab does. So looking at uh, interesting. Oh, so I mean, you're talking about physical experiments. Oh, yeah, they they definitely do that once a year at least. They go out into the sea, launch all these buoys. Way, way more fun is when they when they put down their uh, the submarines in the water, the robotic submarines, and then you move around and you see they receive them. Because, That's because actually, if the propagation delay is so important, uh, especially in the air, if you have an air network, then I assume that moving object will behave very differently. Yes. Just because of Doppler effect. Yes. So yes. What do we do with this? Yes. Yes. So, this is at a at a Mac level or TDMA, Mac, you know, media access control, pro, uh, medium access control protocol sort of level, but uh, at a at a lower level, you need to deal with Doppler in much more interesting ways here because if you're doing, let's say, you know, some kind of frequency shift keying, with Doppler, your yes, frequency is going to shift. So that's the kind of stuff you need to deal with a lot. Uh, because it's so it's so close to your your speed of sound in water. So, um, so oh, but you yeah. just now realized something. So, so, I mean, not, not, but in general, mm -hmm. so this scheme presupposes that you don't need to hear anything to be able to transmit. Yes. So, like two whales couldn't tell a knock knock joke to each other using this protocol, right? Yes. That's like a pretty big 
assumption. Well, uh, you you. What do you mean? In the sense that if everybody has a schedule, it just depends on when you start, right? So you can start at any any given point of time in the in the frame, right? No, but okay. Like suppose you okay. So, like, suppose you have two right. players. Okay. And they want to tell a knock knock joke right. to each other, right? So they. So you, when you're saying that you can't arbitrarily decide when you want to start transmitting. No, no, no. What I mean is, like, if I say knock knock, yeah. you know, you will have to ask yeah. who is it. Yeah. But you don't know that you want to ask who is it until you have heard that I said knock knock. So you can't, you know, tell me who is it while I'm saying knock knock because you haven't received. Yet right. That yes. But that's that's an issue with propagation itself, right? I can't I can't that's like causality, right? No no no. He's he's thinking in terms of a not fairness. Okay. This one is thinking in terms of a link fairness. So you can knock knock be, be, until you re, until you reply, you just keep knock knock knocking until the other person say knock knock. Oh yeah, okay, then then the it, it you don't know you are which stop until you, you start counting uh. You are not 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 who's there, there's who uh. So you have to start counting uh. Is that no I'm, I'm no, but just wait wait. If you say knock knock now, he only can reply who's there when it's his turn to transmit to you again, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, he that's not say why. No, he would be replying to something else, or he might just not. Yeah, so I have to wait oh, for. I, I'll have to wait for my next slot with you yeah, to be right. able to because to reply. Yes, that's I agree. You might still have something else to tell me. What yes. you mean in the first yeah. slot? Yeah. Uh, so okay. so the idea is he might have something. The idea is it's a fully saturated or yeah. loaded. In the sense, everybody always has something to say. Oh, that's an assumption. Yes. That's, that's an assumption. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's just horrible. <laughs> that's horrible. No, no, no. We are we are making this. This is a big mistake. We are we are going to cause the wheels to be very miserable. <laughs> <laughs> very miserable wheels. Um, so back to the the improvements to computational efficiency. Uh, so basically, they're trying to use different kinds of uh, heuristics to reduce the comple computational complexity of the decision uh, prog uh, dynamic programming problem. Uh, I don't really understand a bunch of things here, uh, but basically, they're trying to to make uh, tra basically tra trying to add heuristics like transmissions that has minimum impact on the potential future transmission is chosen. Right. So you try to ensure that the way you are doing something doesn't put you in a in a step where you are now restricted in a you know much narrower thing. I, I didn't really get in more into detail with this, but I don't know if there's some relationship with this and the AI stuff that people do for decision trees, uh, because it's it seems similar in some some sense, but I it's I do not have the fundamental understanding of dynamic programming enough to be able to see if that is some relation with that. Isn't this the obvious greedy algorithm? Yeah. So you don't really need anything more. That, that's the whole point. Right? They, they, do look, they, do, they do talk about how, gre how greedy algorithms or how greedy can it be, <coughs> but, but then the problem is there's some parts where you, you're kind of locked in and you can't really fill every slot right. because of the way it works out. So you have to go back and then try something else instead. Okay. So, uh, but, but yeah, that helps them to reduce it by O n cube, which gives you them some kind of a local maxima, but it's not guaranteed to be a global maxima. So you will have a near optimal uh, schedule, but not a perfect schedule. Uh, so I'm going to move on to conclusion. Uh, so the main conclusion is uh, large propagation delays for uh, the order networks, rather than being harmful, leads to interestingly leads to significant performance gains compared to wireless networks with neg negligible propagation delays. Uh, making interfering packets overlap in time at unintended nodes and leaving desired packets to interfere. Interference free at intended nodes is what we are trying to basically do. Uh, using the interference time laden slots for transmission. And you basically get n by 2 as the upper bound to what you can really do if you have a perfect network, perfect schedule, everything is perfect, the seas aren't choppy, the whales are happy then you get n by 2. But um, from my understanding, personally, with the people who did this research, they have managed to use it with like a 6, 8, 10 node network. They have phys like the physical network. They haven't, uh, it, it kind of works to a certain extent. So you do get sort of much closer to 1 than normal. But they haven't actually been able to get serious real life throughput more than 1. 
uh, yeah, in real life yet. So. Because they always have this, like you're talking about, like choppy seas and stuff moving about and randomly the things go missing and... Actually, I don't need more than one. If in choppy sea condition, they still can get one, they have... Do you remember how much they got? I think uh, with the... So, just for context, after this, is there's a thing in another paper. Yeah. Paper where uh, he was talking about if you're really far away, then you won't hear things. Mm -hmm. So you can also emulate that by changing your source level. So if you, you can talk softer, you can. then you eliminate other nodes. So you can have some transmissions that are softer, allowing someone else to transmit ah. and do... So they did more, more interesting things yeah. with power... With more complex geometry, with power... Power modulation. Power yeah. modulation. Yeah. Yeah. So there's another paper that I think that was just published this last year, uh, this year or last year, yeah. end of last year, I don't remember. So they were um, testing that out at sea. I think we got, I think just one or maybe just a little bit. Slightly shy of one. Less, shy slightly of less one. than one. Yeah. I, I know uh, that it was not one was because one would have been like, you know, yeah, a, mo a movement, like the people would have been super happy, but slightly less than one, but close to. If we are talking about power modulation, that sounds like AM. AM. Uh, yes, I but it's not that, oh, it's no, not no, that. Not, not, no, 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 no. It's, it's not. No, it's not. So the idea is, it's the same concept, but in, to ensure that you don't receive, like I'm talking to him, that this is the easier way, I'm talking to him, and I don't want you to listen, so I talk softly, so you can still talk to him. So, so it's adding, I can link you to the paper. I think the paper it will explain that way better than I do. So amplitude modulation would be if you're modulating within the packet to transfer information. Yeah. Here it's more of just I am whispering to him really quietly, so you don't even realize I'm here. So you can just so you can happily talk to him without having any interference. So that means you are actually you can being two different networks. But when you want to talk to me, you can yell. You can still yell loud enough so you can get. Anyway, this is another paper, so easier e easier to let it to that paper to explain that. Yeah. So you're saying given that. Hinges on is just the propagation delay. Does yes. this readily apply to interplanetary RF? Yes. Yeah. Yep. I was thinking about it. Yes, that is exactly where a lot of the uh, delay tolerant. Yeah, delay tolerant networks, yeah. as they're called. There, there's a bunch of research going into that. So the people in this lab sort of do follow what's the, what's happening there. But that, so it's interesting, right? We talked about propagation delay. It's about time taken for in the medium. So data, data issues also distances, right? We, we assume distances in, in all networks, all terrestrial networks are, you know, of human scale. But when you talk about interplanetary networks, okay, then the like distances, the, 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 although the speed is still fast, you know, the distances are different. So then it becomes interesting as well. So stuff like this could be very useful because you could do exactly this yeah. between planets. I mean, ignore my blue background, assume it's space, <laughs> change the speed of sound, and the N1 and N2 can be planets. Right? Like actually, the problem I understand with deep space network is because of the distance, the signal network. You actually have the So yeah. the, the, the normal rates are of the order of kilobytes, and now we upgrade the network and we have like megabit per second. Yeah. Now. Awesome. Yeah, I know. But there's some interesting things that might might, for example, the whole um, um, uh, full duplex issue, uh, half duplex issue, might not might not apply to the plant So you can do more interesting things because right? self noise might not be so high. So you might be able to have more directional um, sort of. Okay, I don't need to do direction because yeah. light you need. Sure, outside. sure, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's direction you must have. Yeah. So 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 you, the the whole half duplex thing is thrown out the water, right? So you can. You can do full duplex, I don't know, multiple duplex, whatever. You can do all sorts of things. Let's run out of the water. So into water. Anything uh, else? Uh, yes. Have they stayed, have they experimented with uh, mixed media? I think the lab has done that, but I don't have any understanding. Uh, I don't have any specific um, knowledge. Like so, so I'll just give you a quick understanding of my relationship. I don't work for the lab. Uh, I do work with some of the research that comes out of the lab. So I have understanding of some of the stuff they do, but I don't have understanding of everything else they do. So I can only talk about, I can only, I can talk very comfortably with what's in the paper, but anything outside, I think you might want to ask them directly because they probably know more than I do. I mean, I'm just curious. On, on the, on sure. The, while, while, while we are talking about this, uh, because I, I want to see, Okay, so I, um, well, I'm thinking 
if if you deploy this together with you know Google has this the moon tech sure. so you have Yep. Both the yep. Air yep. And the C yep. and three D and all sorts of things. I recently met a bunch of researchers who are looking exactly into that. Then, uh, then that they can do because they can then augment stuff and, and figure out what's better. Uh, you can do stuff like data muling, as they call it. So if you have a one link which is much faster, which is through the air, then you can you can sort of t you, the, you the can summary can go yeah, you can summary can go there, take the data, bring it here, go through the thing and then go up. Yeah. Kind of stuff. So. Thank you very much, and I will finally give the time to Melvin for the...